Will you join me in our call to worship, please? We are a justice-making, truth-seeking people. We share a reverence for the mystery of life. Come, let us worship together. Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. Really? Thank you. It is good to be back together again. Whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary or remotely via Zoom, it's good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between online and in-person participants. We're calling this connection opportunity greeting our virtual neighbors. First, we will project the image of folks who are currently on Zoom. Ta-da! Give them, and we'll ask them to give us all a wave. Then, if everybody could please turn around, smile for the camera right there in back. Let's give our neighbors. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we're building BUC. At home, on campus, in the world, every day, we are Birmingham United Unitarian Church. <laughs> and we're also not quite perfect. And 
we are all building a beloved community. Okay. Sometimes you just got to flip a coin with these things. <laughs> We'll join now with other Unitarian Universalist congregations around the world in lighting our chalice. This chalice is lit as a symbol of hope and joy and warmth. It is the light of reason and the warmth of community and love and truth. May it be so. Amen. The first hymn this morning is for the beauty of the earth. It is number 21 in the gray hymnal. If you'd like to follow along, please stand as you're willing and able to do so. Well, good morning, and welcome to uh, BUC's Earth Sunday worship service. Uh, Earth Day is actually next Saturday, but Earth Sunday is celebrated the week before, so here we are. As I've said many times before, there are no UU holidays, which is mostly true, but an argument could be made that Earth Sunday and Earth Day is a UU holiday. The first Earth Day was held on April 22nd, 1970. It was the project of Senator Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin, who was an environmentalist and a Unitarian Universalist. Yeah. <laughs> Across our history in this nation, UUs have been at the forefront of environmental movements. Some of our most noted historical figures made the connection between religion and respect for the interdependent web of life long before we had those words. Each of us builds our own personal theology as you use. Today we will learn about religious naturalism, religious naturalism, Derek, I caught it, I can't talk. Religious naturalism is a theological option that centers respect for the interdependent web of existence. I'm excited to talk with you a little bit about it. So for today's Time for All Ages, we're going to take a quick virtual field trip to a place called Mystic Lake. It's a place that's very special to me, um, and it is because of BUC that I actually found this special place. 
And um, one of my favorite things to do was to take my campers out uh, to the marsh and to our Little Mac Bridge. And we would take a pack out lunch and I would read a story and I'm gonna share that story with you all today. It's The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. At the far end of town where the grickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and no birds ever sing excepting old crows is the street of the lifted Lorax. And deep in the grickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax? And why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere from the far end of town where the grickle grass grows? The old Wunsler still lives there. Ask him, he knows. You won't see the Wunsler. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lurkum on top of his store. And on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out of the shutters. And sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lorax was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. On the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail, and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail and the shell of a great, great, great grandfather's snail. He pulls up the pail, makes a most careful count to see if you've paid him the proper amount. Then he grunts, I'll call you by whisper my phone for the secrets I tell are for your ears alone. Sloop, down sloops the whisper phone to your ear and the old Wunsler's whispers are not very clear since they have to come down through a snurgly hose and he sounds as if he had smallish bees up his nose. I'll tell you, he says with his teeth sounding gray, how the Lorax got lifted and taken away. It all started way back such a long time back. Way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the song of the Swami songs rang out in space. One morning I came to this glorious place and I first saw the trees, the truffula trees, the bright colored tufts of the truffula trees mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. And under the trees, I saw brown barbalutes frisking about in their barbalute suits as they played in the shade and ate truffula fruits. From the ripulous pond came the comfortable sound of the hummingfish humming while splashing around. But those trees, those trees, those truffula trees, all my life I'd been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their tufts was much softer than silk, and they had the sweet smell of fresh butterfly milk. I felt a great leaping joy in my heart. I knew what I'd do. I unloaded my cart. And in no time at all, I had built a small shop. Then I chopped down a truffula tree with just one chop. And with great skillful skill and great speedy speed, I took the soft tuft and I knitted a need. The instant I finished, I heard a gzoop. I looked and I saw something pop out of the stump of the tree that I'd chopped down. It was sort of a man. Describe him? That's hard. I don't know if I can. He was shortish and oldish and brownish and bossy. He spoke with a voice that was sharpish and bossy. Mister, he said with a sawdusty sneeze, I am the Lorax, I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs. He was very upset as he shouted and puffed. What is that thing you've made out of my truffula tuft? Look, Lorax, I said, there's no cause for alarm. I chopped just one tree, I'm doing no harm. I'm being quite useful. This thing is a thneed. A, th a thneed's a fine something that all people need. It's a shirt, it's a sock, it's a glove, it's a hat. But it has other uses. Yes, 
far beyond that. You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains, or covers for bicycle seats. The Lorax said, sir, you are crazy with greed. There is no one on earth who would buy that fool need. But the very next minute, I proved he was wrong. For just at that minute, a chap came along, and I, he bought that need that I had knitted was great. And he thought that the need I knitted was great. He happily bought it for $3.98. I rushed across the room, and in no time at all, I built a radio phone, and I put in a quick call. I called all my brothers and uncles and aunts, and I said, listen here, here's a wonderful chance for the whole Wunzler family to get mighty rich. Get over here fast, take the road to North Niche, turn left at Weehawken, sharp right at South Stitch. And in no time at all, in the factory I built, the whole Wunzler family was working full tilt. We were all knitting thneeds just as busy as bees to the sound of the tropping of truffula trees. Then, oh baby, oh, how my business did grow. Now chopping one tree at a time was too slow. So I quickly invented my super axe hacker, which whacked off four truffula trees at one smacker. We were making thneeds four times as fast as before. And that Lorax? He didn't show up anymore. But the next week, he knocked on my new office door. He snapped, I am the Lorax who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown barbalutes, who played in the shade in their barbalute suits and happily lived eating truffula fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, there's not enough truffula fruit to go round, and my poor barbalutes are all getting the crummies because they have gas and no food in their tummies. They loved living here, but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food, and I hope that they may. Good luck, he cried, and he sent them away. I, the Wensler, felt sad as I watched them all go, but Business is business, and business must grow, regardless of crummies and tummies, you know. I meant no harm. I most truly did not. But I had to grow bigger, so bigger I got. I biggered my factory. I biggered my roads. I biggered my wagons. I biggered the loads of needs I shipped out. I was shipping them forth to the south, to the east, to the west, to the north. I went right on biggering, selling more needs, and biggered my money, which everyone needs. Then again, he came back. I was fixing some pipes when that old nuisance Lorax came back with more gripes. I am the Lorax, he coughed and he whiffed. <clears throat> he sneezed and he snuffled, he snargled, he sniffed. Onceler, he cried with a cruffulous croak. Onceler, you're making such smogulous smoke. My poor swami swans, well, they can't sing a note. No one can sing who has smog in their throat. And so, <clears throat> said the Lorax, please pardon my cough. They cannot live here, so I'm sending them off. Where will they go? I don't hopefully know. They may have to fly for a month or a year to escape the smog you've smogged up around here. What's more, snapped the Lorax. His dander was up. Let me say a few words about gluppity glup. Your machinery chugs on day and night without stop, making gluppity glup also schloppity schlop. What do you do with this leftover goo? I'll show you, you dirty old onceler you. You're dumping the they're glumping the pond where the humming fish hummed. No more can they hum, for their gills are all gummed. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. They'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. And then I got mad. I got terribly mad. 
I yelled at the Lorax, now listen here, Dad. All you do is yap, yap, and say bad, 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 bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you, I intend to go on doing just what I do. And for your information, you Lorax, I'm figuring on biggering and biggering and biggering and biggering, turning more truffula trees into thneeds, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. And at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From the outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an ax on a tree, and then we heard the tree fall the very last truffula tree of them all. No more trees, no more thneeds, no more work to be done. So in no time, my uncles and aunts, everyone all waved me goodbye. They jumped into my cars and drove away under the smoke smuggered stars. Now all that was left neath the bad smelling sky was my big empty factory, the Lorax, and I. The Lorax said nothing, just gave me a glance, just gave me a very sad, sad backward glance as he lifted himself by the seat of his pants. And I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he hoisted himself and took leave of this place through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace. And all that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with one word, unless. Whatever that meant, well, I just couldn't guess. That was long, long ago, but each day since that day, I've sat here and worried and worried away. Through the years while my buildings have fallen apart, I've worried about it with all of my heart. But now, says the Lorax, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So, catch, says the Wensler. He lets something fall. It's a truffula seed. It's the last one of all. You're in charge of the last of the truffula seeds, and the truffula trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new tree, treat it with care, give it clean water and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest, protect it from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. So today in RE, we're gonna do our part to help plant some plants. And so at this time, if I could have all our K through fifth graders head to the back of the sanctuary and head off to class. And so continuing in the uh, failure tradition that I set up just a moment ago, I'm having trouble accessing the uh, invitation to gratitude. Oh. <laughs> I am having trouble accessing the invitation to gratitude just to continue what I started a moment ago. Um, but I do know every week we dedicate our, tra our gift to BUC to another uh, organization. Half goes to BUC in maintaining the church, half goes to another worthy organization. And this month it is, do you recall? Yeah. 
it's uh, a Relief Michigan, um, and they are, I think, the only statewide nonprofit that plants trees in the state of Michigan. They've planted just an inordinate amount of trees, and so we're going to give them half of our offering this month to help them continue their good work in that area. It's okay. It's just church. <laughs> So please give generously. Uh, if you are attending via Zoom, there are links to our various ways to donate, uh, Zelle, Cash App, PayPal. Uh, please. No? Just Venmo. Just Venmo? Yeah. I thought you had all of them. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. We are a church. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. We come to the time in our service that we set aside for spiritual practices of prayer and centering. You know, sometimes every now and again there's a service where you just, I think we all need to hold hands, have a shot of espresso, and say a prayer. <laughs> sometimes it just happens. Uh, we, uh, we haven't had any submissions for joys and sorrows today, but maybe we can just say a little moment for us who are leading the service because, um, you know, it's not meant to be still life, and sometimes it can be really stressful. And I just want to say, I think you're doing great. You're okay. So that being said, I invite you to move with me into a spirit of prayer or centering. We stand in awe of the mystery of life. We have stories and we have ideas of where life came from. We get closer to understanding those origins daily. And we know that what we have is a limited amount of understanding that we work within a paradigm, and a paradigm shift. 
and the way we understand things may change. It can be hard to be comfortable with not knowing. We don't know where we come from, and we don't know where we're going. But we do know that there is so much value, so much joy and awe and love and respect in this earth. We are profoundly connected to all that is. As we have more tools and more knowledge to help us understand that, we learn that there's just so much more there. Let this be a source of inspiration for us and let it be our aspiration to protect and care for the things that we can. As we struggle with climate grief and climate anxiety, may we be reminded and held in the deep love of this congregation that there is so much more. We need to be moved to action, but may we be moved from a sense of love, and not fear. May we find ways to continue on in courage together. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. To make space for the mystery of life and all that is, we'll spend time together now in silence. Today we're celebrating Earth Day, established in 1970. The Earth was established somewhere around four and a half billion years ago, though. Did you know that about, about a billion, 1.1 billion years ago, where we're standing right now was a shallow ocean? And there was a huge rift running from Iowa up through the UP. What was the fiery basin has become the basin of Lake Superior. And that crack where the continent was trying to rip itself apart, the mid-continent rift, you can still see evidence of it going all the way up and around and even down through parts of Lake Huron. Uh, but now it failed. It, it, was, it was an aborted rift and we were left with an even more shallow depression, even more water all around us. It was the landscape, a landscape that had been dry and not covered in basalt for eons, but it survived it. Landscape altered. And then glacier after great glacier scraped its way across the landscape, leaving scars, 
exposing wounds of copper deposits left from those same magma deposits that the rift tried to open up. And believe it or not, beautiful silt. We get great agates that have been scraped down from Canada. Even occasional diamonds, gold, can be sifted out of the Great Lakes. I'd, I'd say that's a, for a pretty cataclysmic thing, that's a pretty good landscape reborn, right? Then after that, there were the untold numbers of early humans, and now, as evidence is showing, even possible early hominids, non-homo sapiens, that could have been existing here in North America alongside those ancestors. And we find a couple other waves, right? Uh, as each one went through, they left their mark to say, we are here, we have been here. Did you know there's uh, petroglyphs just over in Sanilac from prehistory, carved by, well, they used to think pre-humans, but now they're not sure exactly who could have carved them. Could have been one of our other homo ancestors. So that wave altered the landscape, but it also left us things. The Hokia mounds, the, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned, the petroglyphs, they built nations, they built monuments, and we can still see that everywhere we look around us. Less than 200 years ago, there was another wave of migrants, this one coming from Europe, and when they decided to get here, they decided to value the resources more than the people, right? They went through, and did you know that all of the lower peninsula, except for three state parks, four state parks, have been completely deforested? Every tree you see in your daily life here is less than 200 years old. Uh, those parks, if you're interested, uh, there's a stand of trees up at Hartwig Pines, Osable, Russ Forest, Warren Woods. I've been to a couple of them, and I have, uh, I've spent a lot of time outside in my life, and it really is a difference. But during my childhood and all my time outside, I spent digging ditches, swimming, delivering papers, just sitting in a clearing after a long, long walk off the trail. I had thought that what I was seeing was that prehistory. During one of those walks, it kind of collided with me, the reality, wait, no, I'm, I'm not looking at prehistory here. I have to look a little bit deeper. I have to go find those portions. But then I started looking at the landscape. You ever noticed uh, the west, mid and west side of the states, how hilly it is and undulating? If you get off of those interstates, if you get off onto those side roads, you'll notice there's only about a foot of soil. Everything underneath is sand. You see the echoes of that ancient shallow sea that still exists. So it was at that point I believed, you know, I found out my beliefs were kind of wrong. What I thought was timeless really wasn't I had to readjust my mental landscape. I had to have a landscape reborn. Each of these ages from inside of them, it looked timeless. This would never end until it was no longer. Each scar heals, adding further depth. Surface scratches become talking points to new people, a good story to tell. The deeper ones, uh, those are a little harder to address, but that's one of the things we hope to do here, is every day looking to become a slightly better person. So with that change, what I have decided to do is look around and be humble. Accept that scars happen. Everything will scar and it will regrow. I still like walking in the woods. Right? Like I can't do it as much, I'm getting older these days. But one of the things that I always still do and have taught my children to do is bring along an extra pocket, bring along a bag, a bucket, so that you can 
take care of someone else's traces as you are leaving none of your own. I almost forgot the best line, sorry. Be a little life supporting a larger life. Our reading this morning is from Ursula Goody now. This is adapted slightly from The Sacred Depths of Nature. That adaptation was uh, she includes a snippet from The Leaves of Grass that I took out. So today we'll just have the, the prose. Fellowship and community are central to the religious impulse. A friend who was raised Roman Catholic and who travels frequently to foreign cities tells me that she often seeks out the local church when she arrives finding there the shared ritual, the known liturgy and prayer, a haven. Those of us who find a religious home feel deep affinity with those who have moved through this with us, before us, congregating, including, supporting. We offer and receive sympathy and affection. The musicians sing their hushed responses or chant their solemn rhythms and we breathe together, sense our connectedness, heal. Religion, from the Latin religio, to bind together again. The same linguistic root as ligament. We have throughout the ages sought connection with higher powers in the sky or beneath the earth or with ancestors living in some other realm. We have also sought and found religious fellowship with one another. And now we realize that we are connected to all creatures, not just in food chains or ecological equilibria, we share a common ancestor. We share genes for receptors and cell cycles and signal transduction cascades. We share evolutionary constraints and possibilities. We are connected all the way down. I walk through the Missouri woods and the organisms are everywhere, seen and unseen flying about or pushing through the soil or rummaging under the leaves, adapting and reproducing. I open my senses to them and we connect. I no longer need to anthropomorphize them, to value them because they are beautiful or amusing or important to my survival. I see them as they are. I understand how they work I think about their genes switching on and off, their cells dividing and differentiating in pace with my own, homologous to my own. I take in the sycamore by the river and I think about its story, the ancient algae and mosses and ferns that came before, the tiny first progenitor that gave rise to it and to me. I try to guess why it looks the way it does, why the leaves are so serrated and the bark so white, and imagine all sorts of answers, all manner of selections and unintended consequences that have yielded this tree to existence and hence to my experience. Blessed be the tie that binds, it anchors us. We are embedded in the great evolutionary story of planet Earth, the spare, elegant process of mutation and selection and bricolage. And this means that we are anything but alone.
I first encountered Ursula Goodenow's groundbreaking work, The Sacred Depths of Nature, uh, several years ago. I've read it twice. I cannot tell you what it says. It's very complicated, <laughs> and, and I love it, and I don't totally get it. It's beautiful, and it's poignant, and I think you ought to read it. <laughs> if you haven't read it, I think you should. And the introduction to the text, uh, Goody Now is incredibly generous in saying that most of us will not get it and that that is okay. Most of us do not have the scientific background to truly grasp and retain everything that she covers in the book, but many of us will be able to generally understand what she's saying, even if we can't apply it and explain it to somebody else. <laughs> is a book about chemistry, is a book about religion, is the foundational text to religious naturalism, which is also sometimes called spiritual naturalism. The core of religious naturalism is a belief that the universe is one observable whole and that that is sacred is a rationalist theology, which means that it does not include space for supernatural explanations. Perhaps a more positive and generous way to reframe that is to say that religious naturalists rely heavily on science and find theological conclusions solely within the realm of the natural. This is a profound statement of belonging. We are a part of the natural world, and everything that we can understand is also a part of the natural world. We have a place there. There is no veil separating us from not us, because we are a part of all that is, and all that is is part of us. Removing ideas of supernaturalism does not empty religious naturalism of awe and wonder. Think of the beauty of a slow summer sunset, the depths of elephant cognition and culture, the might of a volcanic eruption, most recent images from the James Webb Space Telescope. Simply observing these or any other facet of the universe is enough to inspire awe and wonder. And the more we learn about the universe from those grandiose images of deep space that tell us about the distant past to the tiniest aspects of quantum physics that tell us something about our possible future, the interconnected nature of reality becomes more clear. Previous models of the universe have been based on hierarchy with humanity at the top. Our history is clouded by a misconception that the Earth was created for the purpose of sustaining humanity. Uh, that comes from a Christian misinterpretation of Hebrew scriptures. That text was long translated to say that humanity has dominion over the Earth, the more modern and um, potentially, I think, accurate interpretation is that humanity has stewardship of the Earth, responsibility for the Earth. Although many Christian churches are working to correct that issue, the damage has been done, both in terms of actual damage to the environment and in terms of how popular culture understands that scripture as a mandate to behave badly. The anthropocentric model existed in the realm of science as well, of course. And of course, the church has held power over scientific progress through means of suppression and more subtle cultural influence. And that doesn't even go as far back as scientists being excommunicated like Galileo, uh, all the way back when I was in high school. I remember a science textbook that depicted humanity at the top of a chart portraying evolution. It was a pyramid shape with single-celled organisms and plants and stuff at the bottom and people on the top. And the image is very clear in my mind because I thought it was wrong and biased, and it led to a classroom debate 
you know, I grew up outside of where everybody worked for NASA, so we always had to fight about evolution in school. <laughs> that, was, that was because it was still Texas, so we were going to fight <laughs> about evolution versus creationism. And I was confused in that fight because I thought that both of these models must be wrong. If evolution places people at the top, that cannot possibly be right. And clearly, creationism is not right. Now, I realize that there is an element of time that needs to be conveyed in a graphic that is depicting evolution and that we are pretty new on the scene. I get that, but it, it was a pyramid. <laughs> it, was, it could have been a timeline, <laughs> but it was a pyramid. <laughs> the message was that humanity is the highest aspiration of evolution. It's all been leading to us. And we are in charge. I'm very pleased to say that I tried to find a graphic like this to show you, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> so that's good, some progress. Over the years, this model has faded away, rightfully so, and now the most models are webs with humanity at the center. <laughs> so maybe we don't belong in the center either, but you know, baby steps towards progress. At least now we realize that everything in our universe points to a deep interdependence. A web is better than a pyramid. What we've learned is that we are deeply connected in ways that we don't entirely understand. And we have learned a lot about those connections. It's just those, there's still so much yet to be learned. Interdependence is a shared perspective between religious naturalism and Unitarian Universalism. The seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism is respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we are a part. I can hear you thinking, and I know, that there are proposed changes underway to how we talk about Unitarian Universalism, specifically the principles. I know that. If any changes are ratified, it will be a several years long process. So until such point, we're just gonna talk about the way things are, and we know there's a possibility things might change. So we're just gonna park that over here and talk about the way things are today in this moment. It's a healthy practice anyways, right? Seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of existence. The concept of an interdependent web can mean so many different things. For example, our very molecules are interwoven with everything that is. We are made of stardust. We are made of the very same matter that is the building blocks of everything that ever was and ever will be. The fact that we have been brought together out of the stuff of the universe is a miracle. It is statistically improbable that humanity should exist at all let alone that any specific one of us exists. Imagine for a moment the bonds between hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms forming, breaking down, reforming over millions of years, billions of years, just to come together and be a part of your bloodstream right now. Now imagine those hydrogen atoms and those oxygen atoms, all the plants and animals and people that they've been shared with before you, and where they will go after. Interdependent is too small a word for this process. It inspires reverence and humility to consider the deep connection that we share with each other and all that is. And we are connected quite literally through a common ancestor. It's relatively easy for us to imagine this common ancestor in a close to human form, thinking about someone way back a few million years ago on an African plane, although now we know a Michigan plane. Many of us, I think, are familiar with Lucy, the hominid-ish fossil that was discovered in Ethiopia in 1974. Thinking of her life and the process by which our species evolved to our current status is awe-inspiring. 
And it goes back even further. Like, that's almost as far as my brain can go. But think back, it goes even further. We are the product of evolution from the single point in which life began on this planet. So we can sing with all honesty a hymn of praise to the source of all. Life began, it changed, it multiplied, and now here we are. From single-celled organisms, we have arisen out of all of the ways that matter can combine, out of the triumphs and the errors of human history and the mysteries of why anybody does anything. We were born, and we're still here. That does not put us on top of a pyramid, implying that we are the sum total of evolution. It does mean that we have a responsibility to use our unique abilities and the fact that we have life at all for the protection, the stewardship of the other parts of the ecosystem that we might otherwise harm. If we can under understand ourselves as the younger relative of all living things rather than the ruler of them, we will know our true place in this world, fostering that sense of respect promoted by the seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism. Another connection between Unitarian Universalism, our tradition, and that of religious naturalism is our attitude toward God. Or perhaps it is more accurate to say our attitude toward God? Reverend Dr. Jerome Stone is on the advisory board of the Spiritual Naturalist Society in way back in 2006. He gave a lecture about spiritual naturalism at Meadville Lombard Theological School, which is a UU seminary in Chicago. He broke up spiritual naturalists into three categories. Those who believe that God is the creative process of the universe and he cited 20th century Unitarian theologian Henry Nelson Wyman as an example. Two, those who believe that God is the totality of the universe, also called pantheism. And three, quote, folks like Ursula and myself who do not speak of God and yet whom I think can still be called religious, end quote. Religious naturalism is rooted in the natural, the observable, right? That means that it doesn't have space for consideration of things that happen outside of the realm of observation. According to the Spiritual Naturalist Society, most spiritual naturalists, religious naturalists, do not believe in God and identify as atheist or humanist. However, there is room for the use of the word God in religious naturalism. Ursula Goodenow, who calls herself a non-theist, has said, and I love this, that there are two flavors of God people, those whose God is natural and those whose God is supernatural. In some ways, this is a question of belief, but is also a question of language, and a question that we share as you use. The word God can mean a lot of things. If someone's conception of God can exist within the realm of observation and those ideas are compatible with, natu with religious naturalism, then that's what happens. According to Stone and Goody now, it is appropriate for them to use that term. There's another very comfortable fit between Unitarian Universalism and re religious naturalism here. In both belief systems, there can be room for God, but there that is not the most important thing. In fact, debating over the use of the word could actually be called a distraction from what it is that we mean to accomplish. For both UUs and spiritual naturalists, what one believes and the language that one uses matters much less than what one does. And I'll quote Ursula Goody now a final time here. One can start from the perspective of a religious naturalist or from the perspective of the world religions and arrive at the same place, a moral imperative that the earth and its creatures should be cherished and respected. And that is the point, is it not? Unitarian Universalism's purpose is not to be a thought experiment, but to change the world. And a world that is changed by our respect for the interdependent web of existence is a world 
where environmental priorities are understood as foundational and exigent among other priorities. It is a world where habitats are protected over corporate profit margins, where sustainable sources of energy are the norm, and where we prioritize the needs of those most impacted by climate change in our policymaking. This is the world that we dream about, and we share that dream with religious naturalists. We do not arrive at these ideas out of sentimentality. This is not wishful thinking. It is a deeply held religious impulse. We should live a different way because our destinies are intertwined with each other and with the world around us. We must live a different way because if we don't, we will bring this planet and ourselves to ruin. We can live a different way because our faith gives us hope. Not hope in a miracle, supernatural fix, but faith in ourselves and hope in our ability to get there. We evolved from the single beginning point of life on this planet Surely we can make something more than that, more of that than being the biggest threat to existence of life here. We've come all this way through resilience, ingenuity, hope, and love for each other and the world around us. Revelation is not sealed. We are always learning more about the nature of life in the universe. Our fate is also not sealed. Religious naturalism is a theological option that can help open a way to a future built on respect for the interdependent web of life and cause us to turn things around while we still can. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Today's closing hymn it's one of our favorites. It's the Blue Boat Home. Please stand as you will enable and sing with joy. <laughs> Still my dry land, I can say. 
Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.